It's your same daily debrief and it's your same people's dispatch. But we have got a completely new look starting today. And it's not just this big screen. In the coming days, you'll be seeing more guests from across the world. In this new show, which keeps asking the important questions. What are the people's movements struggling for? How are people across the world mobilizing against imperialism? And how do geopolitical developments that are happening around us today affect our future? In this spirit, we go today to the summit between Russian and African leaders, think about what lies ahead for BRICS, and also take a look at the struggles in Latin America. But before you go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button under the video, just so that you can watch future episodes of this show and other videos we produce from across the world. So there we have it. Let's start off with this revamped daily debrief. Our first story in today's episode is from Russia, where heads of 17 African countries and leaders from many more have gathered for a summit. The two-day summit between Russia and the African countries began on Thursday. Now, there's a lot of interest in this summit due to the war and the recent debate about the Grain Deal. Russia withdrew from the Baltic Sea Grain Deal, saying that none of its conditions had been met. But it also made a very important point. It said that most of the grain had not gone to poor African countries, as had been the plan. Now, the Western media has been actively trying to portray this summit as a failure. But is this really so? We go to analyst Kambale Musawali to find out. Kambale, thank you so much for joining us. Very significant summit, of course, leaders from many countries going to uh, Russia. The Western media seems intent on portraying this as a massive failure. And, you know, you get the sense that there have been some behind-the-scenes moves to ensure that some of the leaders from Africa don't make it to Russia as well. I believe the DRC, where you're from, is also one of those countries. Indeed. I mean, it's not even a question of, of failure or success, that the way we have to look at it, right? We have to look at it on a historical background. There have been a China-Africa summit, there have been a U.S.-Africa summit, and there is a Russia-Africa summit. The way I'm looking at it is that Africa is at the center of the transformation of the world. And uh, people are engaging Africans in seeing what is the contribution uh, to the transformation of the world. If some leaders are, have not attended, it's not an issue. Uh, it's the same for any other um, uh, forum that's, that existed before. Uh, you mentioned the DRC. Uh, it's quite fascinating. You know, whenever we're looking at the Russia-Africa summit and the fact that the Minister of Defense uh, is actually the one who's uh, attending at the mo moment, Jean-Pierre Mbemba and not the president of the DRC, is to go back to uh, the eight contradictions that uh, the Tricontinental has shared in terms of how we look at the, this moment in the world. The president of the DRC visited China not long ago. Um, he has also shown that he's close to the West. And how do we look at a, a president where he is speaking to everyone? It does not clearly show uh, the political ideology. On the ground in DRC, we are understanding why he's taking that posture. Uh, he wants to be able to protect um, his uh, reign, but at the same time, there are some gains that can happen uh, from that. But concretely, what, what unfolded? Before uh, he traveled, uh, before it was announced that the president of the Congo will travel to uh, Russia, it was, uh, the government did share that before he arrived to Moscow, he will go to Kiev. He will meet Zelensky prior to arriving uh, at the Russia-Africa summit. Uh, that was already a problematic inside of the DRC. There were a lot of discussion around diplo uh, uh, technocrats within the government and advisors of the president uh, from primary sources uh, that we have that this was a political suicide that he should not actually go to Kiev before going uh, to Moscow. And a day later, it was announced that he has canceled uh, the entire trip and that the DRC government will be represented at the meeting. And as you know, the DRC government is represented by the Minister of Defense, and the Minister of Defense did not go to Kiev. So clearly, uh, the Congolese government or the Congolese president 
was influenced by outside forces. Um, there is no clear evidence, but the, the way is very close to the United States on some issues. Um, reminds me of uh, Modi in India and how he's uh, pandering to the United States and, and so on. But I think um, when we look at the Russia-Africa summit, when we look at the China-Africa summit, when we look at the U.S.-Africa summit, the message that people should read is that Africa is at the center of the change of the world. Africans are taking agency that didn't exist before. When we had the Berlin conference, Africans were not participating at the Berlin conference. Now we just found out what the decisions uh, were. But today, uh, Putin, uh, his government, uh, Russia as a country, they are looking at Africa as partners and they want them to come uh, to Russia and discuss uh, not just uh, peace and security, not just development, but how we could uh, engage as equal uh, with dignity, with respect. Right, Kamala, it's an interesting point and I want to push that a bit further because if you look at a lot of the coverage, uh, one, it's centered on the fact, you know, there are two things that come up when these issues come up. One is there's talk about Wagner, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Or there is talk about the grain deal and how, you know, African countries are really struggling without the grain deal. And of course, grain is an issue. We must talk about it. But I want to take the point you said, which is about the people in Africa, the countries of Africa being taking far more agency than before. So could you maybe elaborate a bit on that, about especially the factors which are kind of contributing to it? Yeah, um, you mentioned Wagner, and that's something sometimes that uh, also get me a bit worried about the analysis. Um, I remember the United States went to uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and destroyed the world. And there was a mercenary group called um, Blackwater, if I recall. I don't remember these analysts speaking about Blackwater the way they are speaking about Wagner today. Uh, Wagner is a private company. Uh, they are working with some African countries, and these African countries have security objectives that they want to attain. They may decide to work with Wagner, they may not decide to work with Wagner. That's really a national decision, right? Countries deciding what would be good for them. Uh, specifically now for the agency of Africa, this is really fascinating what is happening uh, right now. Um, and I'll go back to the point about Ukraine. Uh, the President Zelensky of Ukraine wanted to meet with African president at the African Union. Um, I think almost all of them did not attend the meeting at, at the African Union. Uh, he pretty much just spoke to a room of diplomats. Why did that happen? Right? Africans are saying we are in 2023. This is not uh, the time where there is European conquest. Uh, Western invasions, I mean, still ongoing. But Africans are saying that if we need to change uh, the conditions of our people, we need to get the expertise of the world. Humanity has a long history of how we solve problems. And there is not one country that has the monopoly on how to solve problems that African countries uh, have. So Africans are saying, we are going to speak to the East, to the West, to the North, to the South. Some nations are very clear about why they should speak to the East, why they should go to uh, China, why they should go to Russia? Because let's say, for example, in the case of China, China achieved one of the biggest feats in the history of humanity. They eradicated extreme poverty, right? Took out of poverty the majority of the population. Africans are looking at what is happening on our continent and say that we have arable land, we have resources, human resources and natural resources. How can we harness that in a way where we don't destroy the environment, but we put the human at the center. We know we have the response, uh, the answer to that in Beijing. Um, and we're looking at also uh, Russia for energy, right? How can Africa uh, have electricity? Uh, how can Africa learn all the strategy of agriculture? So these African leaders, they're looking or some of them, of course, at uh, what they can learn from the world to improve the condition of their people. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the West, particularly the United States, uh, sticks to have a monopoly on who uh, the African people have to engage with. And African leaders are saying no. No, that's why uh, you're seeing um, many African, I think over 40 of them, are currently 
uh, in Moscow uh, to discuss how they could work uh, with Russia to improve the lives and the conditions of their people. Thank you so much, Kambale, for speaking to us. Very valuable analysis and I think very essential summit to look forward and to analyze also for the reasons you mentioned. From an ongoing summit to another which is going to be held in just a few weeks from now. We are talking, of course, about the BRICS summit. It's going to be held towards the end of August. Now, BRICS currently comprises Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, the last of which will be the host country. There's a lot of interest around this summit as BRICS is re-emerging as a major pole in world affairs. Many, many more countries want to join the platform as well. More importantly, there's also interest in this summit because of the possibility of what a BRICS bank can do. There's been a lot of talk about even a new currency. We go to Vijay Prashad, who's in Brazil now and has been chronicling the re-emergence of BRICS and its significance. Vijay, less than a month left for the BRICS summit and I think in Brazil you would have also heard quite a few discussions. Brazil, very much the... Uh, in, in the center of this summit because it's uh, Lula has come back. There's, of course, uh, you know, a fresh push. Dilma has been appointed as the head of the bank. So how do you, uh, you know, say about a month before, how do you, what do you see as the main possibilities of BRICS at this point? See, the, this is the 15th summit of the BRICS heads of state. But in a way, I think this is the most exciting summit. Um, this is the first real summit where we've got this new mood across the countries of the BRICS, you know, um, of course, the political alignments within the countries are all very different. India is a, is a far right government um, led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Uh, Brazil has a left of center government led by uh, Lula da Silva and so on. You know, these are not all of the same political um, tradition. Nonetheless, there is a common mood in all these countries a mood that says that they want to now try once again. Uh, and I want to emphasize once again, they want to try once again to establish a kind of southern pole um, that isn't entirely, um, you know, subordinated to Western interests. Uh, I say once again, Prashant, because this was indeed the reason why BRICS was created in 2009 as a way to exit um, the reliance upon the United States says the market of last resort, reliance upon Western investment, reliance upon the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Well, that first attempt to establish some sovereignty for these countries, or at least create separate institutions, didn't quite take off. The institutions were created, but they were pretty hollow. Now, with this new mood across these countries, mood suggesting, look, we don't want to be as the South African Foreign Minister Nalini Pandor said, we don't want to be bullied by the West. This mood uh, is now what is going to come to South Africa. And really, let's see um, what the mood produces. Right, Vijay, of course, that's a very important point you made because we're talking about, say, the BRICS Bank, the possibility of a new currency, etc. So in many of these circles, what have you sort of seen as far as the economic aspect is concerned? Because I think that's really where you know, a lot. And that is also maybe why many of the other countries who want to join BRICS seem so interested right now. Well, to be frank, and if you look at the statistics, investment rates inside Europe have declined precipitously. And foreign direct investment coming from the West to southern countries on favorable terms has declined quite dramatically. Uh, it's pretty clear to most people that right now the surplus holding countries are not in the West, at least those that are willing to lend on favorable terms for infrastructure development, not um, to finance debt uh, servicing. So that means, of course, China is in the lead here, but also India to some extent and so on. So the idea is that countries are interested, thinking, look, the game is there. I mean, maybe at the G7 meeting, G20 meeting, the West is the powerhouse in terms of military power and diplomatic power and information power and so on. But if you want a good deal, you've got to come to the BRICS summit. I mean, in a sense, this is returning to the source of what the BRICS was. It was meant to be a South-South commercial entity. It wasn't really a political or security alignment. There are some problems, though, uh, both at the BRICS level and at the BRICS bank or the new development bank. Well, what are the problems? One. This BRICS process is only as strong as the central banks in the separate BRICS countries. Now, 
in Brazil, as an example, um, the government of Mr. Lula is in a pitched battle against the central bank regarding interest rates. The central banker is a person appointed by Mr. Bolsonaro, the previous president, um, is not popular at all. But nonetheless, there are some protections that are afforded to uh, the central bank. It's not only the central banker, but there are structures in the bank that are not willing to go out in front and put money on the table. Forget for a BRICS currency. They're not even willing to um, assist in producing a currency of South America, a digital currency called the SUR. So one problem is the, the central banks. And by the way, the central bank in India, the Reserve Bank of India, doesn't have a robust attitude towards the potential creation of a BRICS currency. That's one big problem. Secondly, the politics of the world do impact these institutions. The New Development Bank, for instance, has been keen on lending in what are called local currencies, not in the dollar. On the other hand, most trade invoices in the world today are basically denominated in dollars. So it's not the case that it's so easy to shift to non-dollar uh, trade regimes. Not so easy. Look at the trade between India and Russia. India is sitting on rupees that it owes to Russia. Russians can't claim it and they don't seem to want to buy enough Indian goods. These pose severe challenges. And then on top of that, there is the question of sanctions on Russia. Um, you know, uh, Dilma Rousseff was at the sidelines of the Russia-Africa summit. She talked with President Vladimir Putin of Russia and essentially said, look, I don't think we can make new loans to Russia. Um, this is an important uh, you know, statement of the fact that the sanctions policies around the world do impact the new development bank based in Shanghai. It's not immune from these pressures. So on the one side, there's the limitations posed by central banks, often run by neoliberals. And on the other, there are the international currents that in their own different ways impose themselves on these countries. Right, Vijay, thank you so much for that analysis. It does like the um, mood is very suitable. The objective conditions are very suitable for BRICS to even soar further. But like you said, there are a lot of, uh, we can call them nitty-gritty elements, but which are very concrete, which also have to be dealt with before, you know, we can take things further or these countries can take things further. Thank you so much for that. And finally, Friday, July 28th is the Independence Day of Peru, a country we have been covering actively for the past many months. This is because the people have been taking to the streets time and again against the de facto regime of Dina Boluarte. Now, it's important to remember that Dina Boluarte came to power after President Pedro Castillo was overthrown in a coup in December 2022. There have been multiple rounds of protests in Peru since then, and the Boluarte regime has responded with brutal repression. Despite this, People recently took to the streets of the capital city for what was called the third takeover of Lima. We have with us Zoe, who was in Peru a few months ago and has been actively following the story. Zoe, looks like not a happy Independence Day for a large number of Peruvians who have been dealing with a huge amount of repression, brutal attacks by the government just for expressing their dissent, for expressing their unhappiness with the government. So maybe for the benefit of our viewers, could you take us through what has been the trajectory of the past few months? Definitely. Well, I'll just say that in the past week, it has been these takeover of Lima protests leading up to Peru's Independence Day. Um, people for the past several months have been building towards um, this week of protests, which is not only taking place in Lima, but in cities across Peru. Um, people once again trying to raise these demands um, to demand structural changes, uh, to demand that Dina Boluarte resign, to demand that the Congress be dissolved, that there be new elections held. Um, and so uh, once again, they're on the streets. And as you said, they're facing a lot of repression. Um, organizations, as I said, for the since December have been organizing, have been mobilizing, uh, have been making these demands. And in the past several months, we've seen uh, serious setbacks uh, in some senses because uh, in the first couple of months, there was a lot of international attention on what was happening because of the multiple massacres that had taken place. Uh, we can remember that, uh, well, official numbers don't say this, but uh, all leading human rights organizations in Peru estimate that in the first several months of protest, uh, anywhere between 60 to 70 people were killed by the armed forces, by police forces. Um, <clears throat> the world's attention was on Peru what was happening, what Bino Aluarte was doing, 
Um, this is somewhat decreased and this has seemed to be part of their strategy in a lot of senses to kind of wear people out to make it not a front page issue. Um, and meanwhile, the United States has given its tacit approval and support throughout. Um, and in recent months, uh, some of the positions that Dina Baluarte previously held, such as being more open to maybe changing the date of elections, has shifted. Uh, she seems to be more emboldened than before. She, in June, said that she did not see that she would be set, stepping down any time before 2026. Uh, her, uh, the sects of power in the Congress that have uh, rallied behind her, the far-right parties, which traditionally uh, supported the Fujimorista trend, have also um, really uh, consolidated their support behind her and even made alliances with other parties from the left and from, <clears throat> or formerly from the left, maybe they can't be considered left anymore. Um, so there's been uh, a strong kind of rallying behind this government, uh, despite what is an outstanding and utterly complete rejection of the government by the people. Um, a recent poll said that 90% of people in Peru 90% do not approve of the Congress, 80% do not approve of Dina Boluarte, and 70 want a new constitution. So all of these moves that are being made in Congress by Dina Boluarte are completely not a reflection of the desires and of the will of the people. And that's what's uh, especially concerning, that despite the fact that there's this mass popular rejection, people on the streets mobilizing against her, um, she still is able to consolidate this power despite being isolated internationally as well. Um, she's still kind of moving forward and completely uh, disrespecting what the people actually want. Right. Uh, Zoe, also to sort of uh, get a bit more detail on the current ruling regime in Peru. We know that uh, Dina Boluarte herself uh, you know, was uh, you know, associated with Castillo before. But uh, there's been this co coalition of various interests, like you said. So maybe could you take us a bit more into, you know, what are the sections that have come together to run this government, which is very clearly unpopular? Well, just to give, to roll back a little bit in history, if we remember that in 2021, when Pedro Castillo won the elections, this was a very, very tense election. Um, there had been... Uh, I think over 10 candidates in the presidential elections in the first round. Uh, the fir in the first round, I think he maybe got he got less than 20 percent, being the front runner in these elections. And right behind him was Keiko Fujimori, who's from who's the daughter of a former dictator Alberto Fujimori. And in the second round of the elections, uh, we saw a face off between progressive and left forces that had rallied behind Pedro Castillo and the traditional right in Peru that has always held power, that has um, really uh, had a, a stranglehold on many of the institutions, that um, it controls the media, that controls business. Um, these are the traditional parties of the ruling class um, that are also extremely enveloped in corruption schemes that are, uh, many of them are in, under investigation. Uh, there's dozens of members of Congress that are from these far right and center parties that have been under investigation by Peru's prosecution. Um, and all of that being said is that they united and rallied behind Keiko Fujimori, um, attacked Pedro Castillo at every single possibility. Um, when Pedro Castillo was president, there were three different impeachment motions put forth. Um, these were given uh, a lot of support by the far right, by centrist parties. They were never successful because they didn't have an absolute uh, majority. Um, however, once the coup actually does take place, Dina Boluarte quickly proves that actually she, uh, despite having been the vice president of Pedro Castillo and having come from the Peru Libre Party, uh, she was quite willing uh, to fall in line with these right-wing sectors that for all of these years had been rallying behind uh, uh, Fujimori had been and had been trying to tear down Pedro Castillo. Uh, and so these are the major sectors that have been supporting her. Um, if you look at who's in her government, it's very clear. Um, but also, I think beyond the actual names, it's, it's clear in terms of the media coverage. It's clear in terms of 
if you look at the kind of challenges that were put forth uh, in front of Pedro Castillo, investigations of corruption, of being involved in illegal um, criminal activity, despite Dina Boluarte having been responsible for over 70 protesters being killed, despite many, many more irregularities during her government, she has seen no such roadblocks. Um, so it's very clear that the sectors of power in the country have rallied behind her um, and that they will continue to do so as long as she carries forward with their program, which is not allowing the left to come back, not giving any sections, any concessions to people's movements, not engaging in any sort of negotiations and doing everything possible to undermine them, um, to belittle them, to stigmatize them and uh, to consolidate this, uh, this project, which involves denying people rights. Uh, Pedro Castillo was very bravely actually trying to take on many of the vested interests in the country, mining corporations, oil corporations. Um, he also wanted to tackle the issue of informal labor uh, and subcontracting in Peru, which is one of the major uh, forms of employment. The majority of people are employed in the formal sector. He wanted to actually create more stable jobs, dignified jobs, and this is the response. So um, it's very important to understand that <clears throat> despite her having been part of this left party, all of the major sectors of power have completely rallied behind this, and it's, they've made it possible for her to continue in government and to continue with a minimum level of governability. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Zoe, for that uh, update, as well as I think going through the trajectory of what has happened in Peru, very tragic situation for the people of Peru, but nonetheless, they seem to continue their struggles uh, for their basic rights as well as for democracy. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thanks so much for having me. From the halls of diplomacy at the Russia-Africa summit to discussions about building a different kind of world, a different kind of order through BRICS, to, to the streets of Peru, where people are struggling for democracy. We have covered all these topics in today's episode of Daily Debrief. We'll continue to do so in future episodes, talking about the struggles of people, talking about the issues that matter, talking about the present and the future. Keep watching. And if you haven't hit that subscribe button already, please do.